Hello, everyone. I am here with 2020 congressional candidate from Wisconsin's third congressional district. His name is Justin Bonner. Justin, he's here to talk about his campaign. Thank you so much for coming on the program. Yeah, it's great to be here. I'll admit I was a little bit apprehensive about bringing you on because I like to kind of make myself the best beard in all of progressive politics, but you kind of challenge my uh, dominance there, if you will. So, um, you know, I I'm a little intimidated, to be to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> we just got to go for the full angles beard yeah yeah absolutely absolutely um but you know well, on another hand it is nice to get some beard representation in progressive politics for once <laughs> so uh basically i i wanted to bring you on because your campaign is dynamic i really like what you are talking about you're a software engineer and you are an ordinary person that decided to challenge uh an establishment democrat his name is ron kind and i went over your platform and i really like what you are proposing uh medicare for all and you are very clear single payer medicare for all yes. ranked choice voting free college workplace democracy clean elections uh, a green new deal you want to abolish ice abolish the nsa and abolish the cia now what's interesting is that as a software engineer near you know online privacy is something that's really important to you and before uh we went on you shared an article from 2014 um and this was about and i haven't heard about this company it's called LavaBit, and this is someone who ran a startup for encrypted private email addresses that was essentially um challenged by the government to uh, reveal the information of their customers. And this was really influential to you and important to you. So let's talk a little bit about why you decided to run and why this issue is uh, paramount to your campaign. Certainly, I decided to run purely on the basis of policy. If there was somebody else running who is uh, equal or better to me on policy, then I wouldn't have bothered for it. It's not like it's, um, it's not, I'm not running to be a congressman. I'm running to get the policy done. And uh, like you said, with the uh, abolishing the NSA stuff, it's good. It's uh, as good a place to start as any. So I read that Lava Bit article five years ago now, and that really boiled my blood, as it were, with the NSA. And it makes me angry that our government can act like that in such a blatantly unconstitutional way. Frankly, it's criminal, and we just need to get rid of it. Period. There's no reforming it. There's no well. If you tweak it a little bit, maybe it'll be okay. I say just get rid of it completely. Yeah, and I like that you're taking this bold stance. And a lot of 2020 candidates, they're elevating issues that aren't really being discussed. We're seeing talks of national rent control, talks of reparations for American descendants of slavery. And we're talking about now abolishing the NSA and the CIA with you. And I really find this fascinating because when I read that article, and I hadn't seen that or heard of this, so I'm glad that you shared that with me, it it really sounded like a story that you would hear from an authoritarian regime where, you know, a government would come in and just be brazenly unconstitutional and demand this information. It's a violation of privacy. It's a violation of trust. And um, it's nice that we'd have someone who's a software engineer, someone who's actually technologically literate in Congress advocate, because I know that everyone saw the, uh, you know, the uh, congressional hearings with Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg and some of the questions that were asked, it was just, it was cringeworthy. So it'd be nice to have a little bit of a change <laughs> in someone like you. It's great to hear. I think I'd definitely be an improvement over Ron Kind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think so as well. Now, can you talk about Ron Kind a little bit? Because he's someone who doesn't necessarily have that much national name recognition. So um, explain why, if you're progressive, if you are a democratic socialist, it's better for people in the third district of Wisconsin to support you over Ron Kind. Certainly. Ron Kind's a pretty standard corporatist, centrist, third-way Democrat. I think he was actually leading the New Democrat Coalition for a few years there in Congress. So there's nothing too much to say about you know him on a personal level or anything like that. He's just a standard cookie-cutter corporate Democrat. And the policies are all the centrist right wing compromise with Republicans. But, you know, we all know what we're compromising with Republicans really means. Yeah. Yeah. It means laying down and dying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's nice to see so many candidates step up because what I would like, even if, you know, I can't imagine a situation where we get like a majority of progressives within the Democratic Party, you know, within 10 years, but just increasing the size of that block in Congress 
I don't think people realize how transformative that really could be. So it is important that we get voices like you elected. So talk a little bit about your campaign and um, what you're running on and what you're doing because you're not taking corporate PAC money. You're running a fully grassroots funded campaign. So what are you doing to kind of get out the word in your district and what issues do you think you'd fight for if you were elected? Sure. I'm trying to get out the word by really focusing really heavily on canvassing. I've gone door to door and knocked on, I think, a couple hundred doors myself. I don't have the exact number right now, but it's definitely been <laughs> pretty busy. In fact, I can show you the uh, canvassing handout that I hand out right here. Yes, as you can see, it's nothing but policy. You know, That's there's great. no picture of me shaking a baby's hand or whatever. And, <laughs> No kissing you know, a baby I'm on the forehead. <laughs> no kissing a local businessman on the forehead. It's just my name, what I'm running for, uh, election date, website, and then the rest of it's just policy and justifications for the policy. So this sheet in particular talks about Medicare for all, ranked choice voting, abolishing the NSA, money out of politics, free public higher education, and the Green New Deal. That's great. I like that you're really like you're putting policies front and center. Because what a lot of politicians try to do is they try to make this like a personality contest and try to be like, you know, oh, I'm charismatic. I've got the charm. I can talk right. I could do the thumb point. And voters love that. They don't love that. But, you know, it's nice to see someone put the policies front and center because that's really all that matters. Like when you're running for Congress, you should be leading with your policies. And the fact that some politicians they don't even have an issues page on their website. It's absolutely mind blowing to me. So it's I nice agree. to see, you know, you really put lead with this. Now you talk a lot about ranked choice voting, and this is something that is just kind of near and dear to my heart. Why do you think that's something that's important? Frankly, I really don't like the two party system. It makes us choose between two usually pretty bad candidates, and it punishes multiple candidates from running in the same party. Like um, in this election, in if, say, there was another progressive running, at the moment there isn't, although there is someone who's considering it, so we'll have to figure something out there. If we were to hypothetically both run, we'd run into a situation where, oh, it'd be two progressives versus one conservative Democrat, and that puts the progressives at a really bad disadvantage there. So in that situation, we'd have to, you know, work something out between the two of us so that only one of us was running up against Ron Kind. Right, With ranked choice voting, of course, we wouldn't run into that problem because then voters could just rank their choices on the ballot and you could have as many progressives running as you want. Totally eliminates the fear of vote splitting, which is super important. There's a piece of legislation. I'm not sure if it's been uh, reintroduced in this session, but uh, Ro Khanna was the sponsor of this legislation. I believe it was 3057. And this would institute uh, nationwide ranked choice voting, but it also did a couple of other things. Um, it ended gerrymandering, and it also increased the district magnitude in every single American district from one to two to three, meaning that rather than us just getting one representative, we get multiple representatives. And what's nice about that is when you look to other countries that have higher district magnitudes, they usually don't just have two parties. They usually have, you know, uh, four to five, sometimes six parties. And of course, in America, it's not like we only have two parties. There's hundreds of parties technically, but it's just a matter of the institutions that we have, you know, um, it just leads to two parties. So we need people to be able to, you know, run in parties that aren't Democrat, that aren't Republican, and actually win. And that's what matters. And that's why I think ranked choice voting is really important, because this would facilitate the rise of multiple parties. And I've always kind of maintained that we don't just need like a third party, we need like five, six, mm -hmm. maybe seven parties. Now, you don't want to get too crazy and have like 12 <laughs> parties because then, you know, the ideologies start to get a little bit watered down. But I think that if we just have more variation than center right and far right, you know, it, it might do wonders for, you know, American policy, policy outcomes specifically. I don't know. <laughs> if we had 12 different parties, at least nine of them would be different leftist fraction parties. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I would totally see that. Yeah, because, you know, there's just, we don't, we don't feel represented, and a lot of voters don't feel represented, which is why when you look at, you know, um, voter identification polling, most people identify as independents. You know, uh, the Republican Party, they're a minority party, technically. Democrats are a little bit better off, but still not by much. So yeah, this I think is Democrats so are only 33% or so, and Republicans only about 25%. 
Yeah. So most people are not being adequately represented. And that's just, it's crazy because, you know, we kind of pride ourselves on being a democracy, the oldest democracy. Um, but how representative is that democracy? Not very much, not very much at all. So uh, uh, what I wanted to talk about is abolishing the CIA because we kind of touched on NSA, kind of switching gears a little mm -hmm. bit. But this is something that is probably a little bit more controversial. And if I'm not mistaken, didn't Bernie Sanders float something like this, like in the 70s or 80s? I'm not sure if he still believes it. But tell me the uh, why this is something that's important, because I feel like this is such a new issue that um, most people don't know the reasoning and why this is important, but how would you sell this? Sure, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, the historical actions of the CIA. I can see some of the books behind you there. Yeah. <laughs> A Chomsky book, so I'm sure you know all the uh, CIA actions, including the September 11th, 1972, you know, the original 9-11 that we executed on Chile, stealing their democracy from them and installing a far-right dictator. And of course, that's only one example. We did the same to Iran. That's why they hate us. You know, it's not yeah. because we have freedom. <laughs> Let's see. I think Venezuela might have actually been the only South American country that we didn't successfully overthrow the government in. Yeah, I could be mistaken, but I think that's correct. And we've certainly uh, been trying. Um, and if we oh, haven't yes. tried to just outright overthrow them, it's always been a constant ploy to get their natural resources because they they have a lot of oil. Yeah, I, I think that that's really important because we are supposedly invading these other countries like Iraq, you know, and Afghanistan. And we do this under the guise of freedom and democracy, which I, I can't even say with a straight face because it's so laughable. But I mean, Allende in Chile was elected and we overthrew him, which is insane. You know, we're, we're not promoting democracies around the world. And a lot of this has been done through the CIA. And what a lot of people, I, I think, fail to realize is that the drone program in the United States is run by the CIA with a fairly large amount of autonomy. The president can mm. certainly rein them in as commander in chief, but this program is killing so many civilians. So when you say abolish the CIA, what I hear is it's about damn time people are bringing yeah. this up and talking about this because I don't think people really realize how destructive the CIA has been mm. around the world. And it's part of the reason why people hate the United States around the world. When you look at mm. global polling, they kind of view us as, you know, a destabilizer. And mm. we're kind of veering into foreign policy. So I think that it would be probably useful to talk about that. How would you be different? Because I see something really problematic happening. I see the Democratic Party by and large shifting to the right when it comes to foreign policy. You have mm -hmm. a few exceptions. What would you do differently to kind of Try to pull that Overton window back to the left. Well, I'd be as anti-war as you can be. I'd never vote for a war. There would have to be some unforeseeable, extraordinary circumstances to make me vote yes on a war. <laughs> yeah. So yes, and uh, I, in terms of foreign policy, I do things like Omar does, where you can criticize Israel. I wouldn't be afraid of being called anti-Semitic. I mean, it's not like I'm planning on being in Congress for a whole career or anything. Yeah. Ideally, I'd only do it for, you know, a term or two, and then we can get the policies through. I don't intend to do it as a whole career. Yeah, that's nice, because um, a lot of people get into politics because they're career minded. Um, you know, and, and you kind of remind me of uh, Lawrence Lessig, but at, you know, the congressional level where you just have like this agenda, we're going to get in past these policies, and then I'm out. I don't need to stay here longer. Um, I don't care about any of that. I don't care about my career. I I'm just a normal dude. And I want to get X, Y, and Z policies implemented. I think that's fascinating. Although, if you are successful at implementing these policies, people are going to want to keep you there. I bet. <laughs> because there's not a lot of like representatives, and we kind of like hold on to and cherish. And sometimes um, deify progressives. You know, maybe that's not the right word, but we overly like. We, we really rely on them because there's so few and even people who, you know, they kind of run as progressives. They kind of go quiet like uh, Jamie Raskin. He's a fairly good congressman, but, you know, he's not necessarily the firebrand that I thought he would be um, when he was elected. So if you are, you know, doing these things and you're heavily effective, I can guarantee this will be your career. Um, regardless if you want it to be or not. But it's nice that you don't have that like as your goal because that means that you're not going to be making these political calculations. You're not going to think, oh, well, this vote could cost me my seat. You're just thinking, you know what? Fuck it. I just want to get in past these policies. And that's really nice. Yeah. And if I have to say something controversial that's true, I'll be like, hey, sweet, maybe I'll lose. <laughs>
<laughs> and I like that. I like that a lot. Um, I kind of feel like I would be the same way because being a member of Congress, it seems like something that would just be pure misery to me. Um, I would never want to. Frankly, run for me too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I get the sense that you're kind of doing this like out of obligation. Like, all right, nobody else is going to do it. Nobody else in this district is running. Um, so I need to do this, and I need to um, get these policies passed. Ron Kine isn't going to do it. Let's mm -hmm. just pass these policies, and then I'm going to retire. <laughs> Absolutely. If there was another good progressive with policies basically the same as mine, I'd let them do it. They can take it. <laughs> That's awesome. I really like that. And I feel like, um, you know, that shows people that you are with them and you are committed to the policies. And I don't think you have to do much more to really um, convince them. So let me ask you this in terms of timetable. I really like to kind of gauge where candidates are at. Um, let's say, hypothetically speaking, you're elected and you get you know, this, we all get this best case scenario where we have a Bernie Sanders presidency and, you know, a blue Senate and a blue house. And we kind of have this limited window of opportunity, at least two years to pass these policies before the next election. What would you just as an individual lawmaker prioritize? Like if you could pick three policies, what do you think feasibly we could get passed? I'd say my number one priority, at least would be ranked choice voting. Because if and uh, secondly, money out of politics, because if you can get those two things, then you're not stuck with two years. And then I guess third would be, you know, Medicare for all, because I don't much care for people dying because they can't afford health care. Yeah. Yeah. Medicare for all is really important. And um, I feel like it's a little bit sad that now on the campaign trail, people who support Medicare for all. They have to go out of their way to clarify no single payer Medicare for all because mm -hmm. we've seen a sort of co-optation of the rhetoric used by progressives. I mean, Kamala Harris just mm -hmm. straight up calls her bill Medicare for all when it's literally not Medicare for all. It's a multi-payer mm -hmm. system. So, you know, it, it's nice to have people fight who are not going to be doing the bidding of large multinational corporations. So. I'm pretty sure that you don't have to do much more to convince my audience. At this point, I feel like we're kind of preaching to the choir because people just want to vote for people who are ordinary, who are going to fight for them. So let me know how we can help, how a viewer, maybe not in the third congressional district of Wisconsin, can get Justin Bonner elected. How do we help you help us? Sure. You can spread the word about me. You can follow me on Twitter. You can always donate on my website. That's justinbonner.com. Donate button. The donate button isn't exactly hidden. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can we uh, can we phone bank for you yet? I don't have any phone banking set up yet. Okay. I Personally, know. Personally, I always think that uh, canvassing is the best way to do it. Yeah. Just to actually see them face to face. Yeah, for sure. Personally, I don't really tend to pick up the phone when I get random calls. It's because I get a lot of spam calls. Yeah. In fact, I even got one spam call recently. They said they were the Bernie Sanders campaign and they wanted me to make a donation. Please give me your credit card number. Ooh, <laughs> that's pretty dirty. That's pretty sketchy. That's a dirty one. See, the worst that I got was um, I got a really nice voice message from this sweet lady who told me that she's just returning my call about my in inquiry to earn $10,000 per week. And I'm like, oh, this totally sounds legit and not like a pyramid scheme. I should definitely give her a call back. <laughs> I will say, though, and I will encourage you to do phone banking for people who live outside of the state, um, because I, the way that I view this is kind of like a national movement. Like, mm -hmm. I don't just think about this as this is Justin Bonner fighting for the people in that third congressional district of Wisconsin. I kind of view this as, you know, you're going to get in and you're going to po pass national policies that help all of us. And I use this in example in every single interview that I do. So I'm sure people are sick of it. But like the Ilhan Omar's bill to cancel student loan debt that's going to affect me and she's not my representative mm. you know so i really I, I think that i always try to go out of my way to encourage mm. people to help candidates even not in their state but definitely if you live in the third district um i totally agree that canvassing knocking on as many doors as you can that is the most effective thing because you know i have no doubt that you'll be outraised by the corporate democrat because they're a corporate Absolutely. democrat because they sell out to corporate interests but you know you are doing this grassroots and people power can override money let me ask you this um what i've heard is that if you raise at least 10 percent of the corporate democrat it seems like you are more viable what do you think you would have to raise in terms of money and how many doors do you think you'd have to knock on? I'm not sure if you guys have done any projections yet to actually defeat Ron Kind. Well, Ron Kind, I believe, has about 2 to 2.6 million in cash in hand right Yikes. now. So we are not even going to approach that. Yeah. But if we can knock on enough doors, I don't think it will matter. Because 
in this district, about 75,000 people voted for Bernie Sanders in 2016 mm -hmm. in the primary. In order to win this uh, primary election, and it's a pretty heavily uh, Democrat, ge Democratic gerrymandered district, mm -hmm. we'll need around 30, maybe 35,000 votes to win. Mm -hmm. So if only about half the people who voted for Sanders turn out and vote for me, then I win. That's really it's just a question of reaching out to those people and making them aware. Yeah. I think the number one most important thing, one of the reasons that our politics is so crappy right now is there are a lot of uh, lower information voters, but they might uh, agree with us on policy, but they may not uh, research all the candidates carefully before voting. Because there are a lot of candidates who, you know, or a lot of voters who, you know, they voted for Sanders, and then some of them probably turned around and voted for Kind, even though they are opposite ends of uh, Democrats. Yeah, I, I always say that for me, I feel like every single progressive that's running would win if every voter in that district knew about them, because mm -hmm. it's just a matter of getting your name out there. Name recognition is always like one of the biggest things in politics. It's one of the biggest hurdles for, you know, insurgent candidates like yourself. Absolutely, uh, I have to agree. Yeah. So, you know, one thing that's important is even if grassroots, you know, canvassing and whatnot matters in order to do that. I would encourage everyone to donate to Justin because you still have to build the infrastructure, um, have a staff that can do this. You still have to be able to print mailers and that needs it, that requires ink, that requires printers. So we need money. But of course, you can do this without 2.6 million, which is just insane. <laughs> Yeah, we're not going to approach anything like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I would be surprised if anyone even came close to that who's running, you know, a grassroots campaign because, like, that's that's such a huge amount of money. Oh, yeah. I mean, He's been in that seat for um, 24 years, I think, give man. or take. He, since 96 is when he won his first election, and I was one then. <laughs> <laughs> it's time for some new blood then, needless to say. So um, the website is justinbonner.com. You can follow him on Twitter at justinbonner95. Support him, help him help you, and let's get as many progressives elected as we possibly can if we want to actually influence policy outcomes in this country and not just have elites influence um, democracy for us. So Justin, anything else that you want to leave us with? Well, uh, I'd say get out there, canvas for your, whoever your local progressive candidate candidate is. If you don't have a local progressive candidate and you're going to be 25 as of January of 21, then run yourself. And most importantly, always research all the candidates before a congressional primary and go vote. Absolutely. That's perfect. We'll leave that there. Thank you so much for coming on, Justin. Great to be here.